so good morning everyone let's start that's the formal start of the working part of the summer school so good news is that we have water from today and for all the days it's there in the corner feel free to take the bottles if you need them and now i'll give the floor to maria yutkevich who is the head of the center for institutional studies at the higher school of economics good morning everyone um, on behalf of High School of Economics, I'd like to welcome everybody here in, in Moscow, in such a sunny weather, and at HEC. And uh, since I was late yesterday and I missed an important part of yesterday meeting or presentation, I'll say a few words about myself. As Marsha said, I'm the head of the Center for Institutional Studies, which, uh, who organized all this summer school for quite many years. And I'm also a vice rector for research at High School of Economics. Um, and I also do some research in economics of education. Why I'm doing that? Because I'm a lazy person. And since I like empirics, I don't want to go far from the university in the industry to get data. So I get data for my research in, around myself. And my position of vice rector helps me to get empirics on, on how people behave at universities. So that's why I'm doing this research in there. Economics of Education, together with my colleagues. I'd like to say a few words about the summer school you're attending. It's a summer school number eight in a row. We started in 2007 with a small summer school with an idea to bring together people who are interested in their institutional economics from Russian regional universities. So we had all regions across Russia, and it was completely Russian summer school. Everybody talked Russian there. And we spent several years bringing people from, from the regions and working with them and making good friends and contacts. And after that, we invited John for, for our, I think, fifth summer school. And that changed everything because John didn't speak any, any Russian. So people had to switch into English to get a chance to talk to him and to listen to his lecture, as that's what completely changed everything because it became their international summer school. And after that, we thought that that's a good idea to bring not Russian faculty, but the international faculty and make everybody learn how to do the international research. That's how we started the Russian international summer school in institution economics. And now we have the international faculty here, and it's my Pleasure to welcome you all here. Thanks for coming and thanks for spending time with us. And we also have the international participants. I think half of you came from different countries and half of you came from Russia. And that's great that we can be here together for a week. Uh, several several um, points about the summer school. I think this is the main idea for the summer school is to bring you and us all together to share the ideas of institutional economics and share the ideas of your own research and presenting your own research and getting feedback. So please appreciate time your colleagues spend with you on that and also give your own feedback. I think it's really important that everybody can share their feedback on, on what other people are doing. That's an important part of the summer school. So once you come to your hotel room or say, restaurant to take something to eat. Don't forget to, to say what you are doing about research of your colleague honestly. That will cheer up everybody. So um, so it's really important to, to, to work together collaboratively. So that means that there are a couple of simple rules for, for that. First, we'd like to ask you not to use your computers and laptops and mobile phones and everything which might distract your from being part of, their, part of the venture during the lectures and seminars. Uh, and if one, someone is presenting the research, imagine that your, that your national team is playing five last minutes of football game and watch it as attentively as if that's your favorite, favorite team and then that's it. So that's it, get fun, get new ideas, get new friends, get new co-authors, because our statistics demonstrate that many, many people who met here each other for the first time are now co-authors in a good journals and also try to 
to find people to, to work with. And that's our pleasure to have you here for a week. And our first lecture will be presented by Sebastian Galliani, and that's my particular pleasure to welcome Sebastian here with us. That's floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. I, I think I... Yeah, that's So, before we go, let me remind you that if you have a question, please wait before I come Hello. to you and give the mic. Don't ask without the mic. Thank you. Hello. Fine. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's the first time I participate in this workshop. Though I, I participate several times in the, the Ronald Coase Institute. Um, and so more or less I know the, the dynamic of, of the event. So what, what I'm going to do is uh, basically give an overview of uh, identification of causal effects in, for people apply, doing applying work. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, uh, in an hour, there's, there's no much I can cover of the whole field. So I'm not going to get into technical details. I'm just going to try to give you uh, an overview. Uh, but I think the overview I'm going to try to give you is, is going to be very useful because it's going to go to some of the important philosophical issues between reduced form and structural models. Uh, and I work in both areas so I can sort of have a, a non uh, kind of a corner view which uh, does seems to dominate the profession. We, we basically solve models, we always find interior solutions, but then we take corner positions, uh, which always strikes me as not uh, expected. So how do I move ahead? Am I, uh, move myself or, yeah, okay. So, uh, I don't know, the program say I have one hour for presentation and 20, 20 minutes for discussion, but I'll more comfortably feel just interrupt me at any time and, and, and make me questions because it's hard to remember uh, towards the end what you want to ask specifically. <laughs> and then I'm going to talk about a couple of examples. Uh, 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 and I basically choose two or three from education because uh, I thought, well, that was mostly the topic, but, but I've done work in many other areas, so yesterday listening to your research, realized that it's not really all about education, so I'm going to be talking about everything, basically, and without much plan, as often happens. Okay. So, you know, if think about this. Uh, there, there is uh, two types of applied research. One is descriptive, and indeed it's very useful, and it's done less and less in the professions, uh, in economics, and in part because it's not highly rewarded. Uh, And, and so a good example of very good descriptive research is, the, is labor economics. In labor economics, they've always been doing extremely interesting descriptive stuff, which basically is useful because it's where we learn about what's going on in the world. So, for example, now in development, there's less of that, uh, although a good example will be all these descriptive studies to what happened to poverty around the world in the last 30 years. And, and, and then I'm going to be talking about that research today, but it's, 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 it's a research I highly value. Uh, what I'm going to be talking is about uh, the other uh, uh, area of applied research, which is the area in which we try to establish uh, causal relations. And there, there is basically two questions people want to answer. One is, does X cause Y? Which is very difficult to establish as opposed to a correlation. And how large is the effect of X on Y? Okay. Uh, 
And how large is the effect of x on y? It's uh, something that we want to know to basically think about um, magnitudes because essentially economics is about man orders of magnitude because we want to compare costs and benefits, right? And so just knowing that S only qualitatively x costs y is not, it's not enough. Uh, and why we're interested in this question, as I say, well, mostly for theoretical considerations, but also because of policy concerns. So let me first characterize what will not be causal analysis, right? In, in, a, in a way that maybe you haven't thought about, but if you take a standard, and it's important for the whole lecture I, I'm going to be doing, take any standard of the textbooks that you have in the first class in, in the PhD program, which is often a statistical inference, and it starts with probability theory and then it covers the theory of estimation, you're not going to find the word causality in the whole book. Right? Causality is not something that you'll, you'll find in, in a standard statistical textbook. And, and, and that is basically something that uh, it is problematic because then different disciplines have been thinking about causality with different frameworks. Okay? And so, for example, biologists have been thinking uh, about causality in a way that is different for the way statisticians have been thinking and in a way that is different from econ economists uh, have been thinking. Though economists are much closer to biologists than to statistics, statisticians, and so we have different models for thinking about causal analysis, and, I'm gonna, and that's going to be the core of, of the lecture. Okay? But let's start with, with what I say will not be the typical uh, analysis, and I'm going to call likelihood, right? Just to put some, some um, specificities in the, in the talk. So the, the aim of standard analysis, typi typified by likelihood, is to infer parameters of a distribution from samples drawn from that distribution. So I, I always think it's very useful when you have any data set to think that in a way, there is a process that you don't know, right, that has generated that data. And that's a stochastic process. And that stochastic process has parameters, okay? And, and, and that tells a lot about my view of the world. I don't do non-parametric econometrics, right? That's uh, obviously, uh, uh, because for many reasons. Uh, if, if I have some time at the end, I could talk about that. But, but for many reasons that I know a lot about that. Uh, and got to believe that it's better to try to, you know, it's like when you write a theoretical model, things I also do, it's a simplification of the world. And, and obviously, when we think about the DCP being characterized by parameters, it's also a simplification of the work. But that's, it, it's very useful. The, we, the way we think is by making these kind of abstractions, and, 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 and by making them, we learn more than so, so that to trying to know every specific detail of the world, right? OK, so let's think that there are those parameters, and think about you get a, a big data set, and, and you can always uh, infer association among variables in that data set, right? And, and, and if you know the likelihood in that data set, uh, you can estimate probabilities, right? As I was saying, this no, probabilities is uh, of, of basically the association of two variables 
is something that you can always do uh, once you have a random sample of the population. And obviously you can update the value of those parameters once you get new data because those parameters are not time invariant. And that's important. So what is causal analysis? Well, causal analysis goes one step further, right? And this is a tricky part. You know, when I was a student, I was reading a paper, and they were doing OLS, um, and it was like a correlation. And then I read another paper, they were doing OLS, and they were claiming causality. And I said, well, it's the same technique. Why one is claiming causality and the other is, is being criticized by being non-causal, right? And that is at the hair of what I'm going to say. So in a way, the aim of uh, a causal analysis is to infer aspects of that data generation process that will answer counterfeit counterfactual questions of the form, what if I intervene the data generating process, right? So I, I'm now going to give you a very concrete uh, and very simple example. I, I think it's in my slides, the example. I don't, yeah, here. Let me just go to the example then uh, go back to the slide. The, the example is, is extremely simple, the simplest I can think of. So let's consider that that's the process that generates the data, okay? That we don't know, but that, let's pretend we know it, okay? So this is saying the wage of individual i is a linear function of its level of education s its ability A, and some other unobserved component. Right? And let, let's assume that uh, it's part of the DGP, that this uh, epsilon, which is something that we have not got to uh, conceptualize, and that's what we treat as a residual, it's, uh, and it's, this distinction is important, obviously, it's orthogonal to education and ability. Okay, that's what the equation one is saying. So then, uh, we have education, and education is also a linear function of ability, and some other and observe the terminals that we have not yet mapped down theoretically or we don't measure, and, and, but they are also orthogonal to ability. And then ability is just a random draw, purely genetically determined, from a uniform distribution. And then there is some pra uh, parameters like uh, all the alphas are positive and all the pi's are positive, right? Meaning that more ability, more education increase your wages, more ability increase your level of education, okay? So now let's go back to all I say. I give you the U.S. Census, and in the U.S. Census you can estimate equation one, right? Just make some assumptions about if you want to do likelihood, for example, you assume that epsilon is, n is normal, you write the likelihood, and, and you estimate it. You don't want to make the assumption that epsilon is, is normal, still you can estimate it by, by, con by OLS, for example, by making some conditional expectations assumption. But, but you have to make some assumptions somewhere, okay? Some assumptions somewhere, you estimate equation equation one, okay? So when you have, let's say now, alpha one, what alpha one is going to be telling you? Alpha one is going to be telling you how much wages will increase, or that's the way you want to read it, right? How much wages will increase if you take someone 
in the population at random and you change marginally or not marginally because this is linear. But if it were not linear, you, you have to be marginal, right? But because it's linear, it doesn't need to be marginal if you change S. So, so let's say if I increase S in an extra year of education for some individual I, alpha I, I want to, I want to answer the following question. What if I increase S in one year? Uh, it's going to be the, the, the increase in wages. What is, is the increase in wages, right? And is that al alpha one. Uh, but, but essentially, the, the answer to that, whether, whether really your estimated alpha one will answer that question, depends on whether essentially you got the right model for the process that generates the data. That's the key. That's the key. So if indeed it is true that the process that generates the data is equation one, you can recover the parameters. But most likely, the process that generates the data is different from your model. And that's why all the complications are. And it might be different because it's different in the, in the functional form, it's different in the, the variables that determine wages. But let's assume for now even a very simple case, which is, no, actually the process that generates the data is equation one, but ability is not observable, right? Ability, we don't observe. And that's, that's, that's typical situation, we don't observe many of the determinants of the outcomes that we deal with, okay? So because ability is not observed, now ability in your model, so the, the alpha 2 times A will go to be part of that error term. That is not going to be epsilon anymore, it's going to be UI, for example, which is going to be the sum of the two, okay? It's what is in this equation. Now, that equation that is there, right, and I want you to get this, is a model, right? So one thing is an econometric model, another thing is the process that generates the data. When they consign, correlations are causal parameters. When they don't consign, they not necessarily you can interpret the correlation as, as, as a uh, causal parameter. So in this case, it doesn't coincide, right? So now, essentially, u i is going to be, as I say, alpha 2 times a, uh, um, i plus epsilon i. So if we estimate now this model by OLS or by likelihood, whatever, we're going to have that a Right now you see I not call it alpha, I call it A because that's basically my, my estimator. A is going to converge in probability, which essentially is a technical way to say that forget about the variance for today. We, today I'm not going to talk about variance. And, and uh, there is a very good reason for that. In an hour, that won't be able to say much anyway. But, but the thing is that there's always ways to, once you have the data, to, to get the best possible estimator of the variance. It's, the problem is identification. It's always identification. So, so in a way, when I, when I teach econometrics to my students, I always say, let's first cover all about identification, because then there is a, then we can go to that textbooks of statistics that doesn't talk about causality, and you have a lot of formulas for different cases to really deal with the standard errors, okay? That's, that's really, I'm not saying it's not difficult, but, but it's something that is always doable. While if you fail at the identification, there's no fix, right? So le let's put it in another way. You just fail at the identification, you present your paper, People tell you, this is not identified with the design you collect the data or with the data, and you cannot fix it. 
they say, oh, it's perfectly identified, but you are ignoring some correlation of the unobservable terms, and you need to correct the standard error for that, you go home, program that, and you change the standard errors. And obviously, the significance can change, right? But, but to the extent that, that uh, that's, doesn't matter, you, um, um, you fix that problem. So, so the, the issue is going to be identification always. OK, so going back to that, then this is going to converge in probability to the true parameter that is what we want to identify, the causal effect, OK, alpha 1, plus something that is the covariance of S and U, divided the variance of S. So the key is this term here, the covariance of S and U. If that covariance is zero, if that covariance is zero, then you're fine. If that covariance is not zero, then you don't recover the causal effect. Okay? And then let's think about is that covariance zero or not? Right? So is it zero or not? A question. No, right? It's not zero because we already know that S is correlated with A. That's what we say in the, in the process that generates the data. Okay? And because S is correlated with A, then uh, if we can hear U is a linear combination of S, then S is correlated with U, then it's not zero. Now, let me tell you something very important. This is an example for the blackboard. Right? In the blackboard, we can always work out this. When you go to give a seminar, the battle is different. Right? Because, because there's no way you can prove that S is correlated with you. Right? Indeed, S is orthogonal to the estimated U by construction. Right? There's no way to test this. It's, so all the battle is going to be arguments about what we think is the process that generates the data. Think all the time about this. That's why I say, when you're going to do your paper, you have to figure out in your mind what's that process. You always have to think about that, but you're never going to observe. You are only interested in alpha 1. Right? That's the only, your only interest in this alpha one. Okay? There's a lot to, to learn about in this example. And, but you have to think about all the other equations, because that's the only way you can think about identification. There's no way you can think about identification if you don't think what's the process that generates the data. That's one. Okay, let me go back now to my definition. So, I say, the aim of causal analysis is to infer aspects of the process that generate the data. I never say we want to identify the whole process that generate the data, right? I never say we want to identify alpha 1, alpha 2. Alpha 2 we cannot identify it's a, because it's associated to an unobserved variable. Still, we want to identify alpha 1. Okay, and why? Because with alpha one, we can predict effects of interventions. Where well, we can now say, do counterfactual analysis. We can say, if I do something that affects S, what will happen to wages? Okay, that's the, that's the idea. Well, when you have a correlation between wages, now let's, let's just go back to the likelihood. If you just have that, right, you know, in the population, we know that for every extra year of education, wages are 20% larger. That is not telling you that if you take someone at random and you do a policy that increases one year of education, his or her wage is going to go up in 20%. 
Because that might be basically all the ability that was omitted. Okay? So it's only the causal effect that will tell you what will be the uh, response to your intervention. Obviously, it doesn't have to be a government intervention. It's often the case that we, we study government interventions. Um, maybe because of a bias uh, that we think that governments are not doing the optimal thing and private <laughs> firms are. But uh, it's, it's tricky because, especially when we get to, to, to structural models, uh, it's very tricky. I, I, I'll talk about that later if you want, uh, if I, and if I have time. But for, that's why I think predominantly you find studies about effects of government intervention. But in any event, it, it's more general, right? We can also predict the effects of spontaneous changes, right? Changes in, in individual behavior, uh, again, could be firms or, or households, or identify causes of reported events, which is often uh, something we dispute about in, in society. Good. I think I say all this. This, I think, is very interesting that, that uh, you, you, you internalize. So, so think about all I say is this. Associations characterize a static condition, right? So uh, if I tell you, uh, you know, in, in, in the population for, for which I really do have a random sample, the, for extra, every extra year of education, wages go up 20%. That's true. It's not that it's not true. It's just that it doesn't answer what happens if I change who has the years of education, right? So causality is about uh, changing conditions as opposed to the picture, right, which is static. Because, in a way, there is nothing in a distribution function that tells us how that distribution will differ if external conditions were to change. Right? So, causality is unavoidably associated to the idea of change, the process that generates the data. So, that's why it's so associated to experiments. And that's why I find this, this view, this, this fight between experiments and structuralists that is uh, overdoing the true differences between uh, methodologies. So I'll get back to that as well. Okay, so then as I say, the several language of causality uh, in different sciences, and oh, if you talk to philosophers, it's even worse. So <laughs> just don't do it. <laughs> but but uh, at least in economics, there's two, right? One is the Rubin potential outcome model, and the other is the structural equation modeling, right? One goes back to Rubin, the statistician, a very nice paper in, in 1974. And the other goes back to uh, uh, the work of Abelmo and, and all the Coles Commission and all the work econometricians done in the 60s to now. But I always recommend my students to still go to Abelmo Econometrica uh, 1943 paper, which I think it's extremely good paper. Um, and that it's very interesting because when you see how Abelmo defined structural parameters, he always make reference to the uh, uh, thought experiment that you should do to conceive the, exper the parameter, right? That's why there is su such an intimate relation between structural models and its co uh, conceptual experiments. Okay, let me start with the Rubin causal model. It's very, very simple. Uh, so these two models are different. And what I, 
uh, the reason I'm going to talk a bit about both is because now when you read applied papers, people don't often make clear to which model they are reporting, okay, or they are using. And, and, and there are similitudes, but there are differences between what you learn in one setup and in another. I, and, and so what's, that's what I'm going to do. But I start by the ruin causal model because it's so natural uh, a way to think uh, that I think it's better to start there. So in, in this model, we're never going to talk about this error term, right? That I have before, this and observables. Uh, and so the people that work very in this literature likes to call the mythical error term of the econometrician. So the, basically, let's think about there is a population, P, and there's units in this population. And then there is causes, and the causes uh, will be D, and the causes are in some set, okay? So there could be many causes, so, but I'm gonna focus to the, to the most widely used uh, example, which is like a treatment uh, in medicine, right? Think of a cause could be the some you receive a treatment and then D is equal to one, and if you don't re receive a treatment, which could be a drug, for example, then D is equal to zero. But as I say, the, 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 it doesn't have to be this zero one setup. So in this model, there is three basically primitives. One is the units. These are physical objects, for example, a person at a particular point in time. There are treatments, and these are actions that can be applied or withheld from a unit. And then there are potential outcomes. And so these are the results of the treatment. So for every unit I, we will think that there is an outcome when that unit is treated, and there is an outcome when that unit is not treated. And also, there are attributes, right? There are attributes associated to units, but there are no causal effects associated to attributes. And, and the reason is because you cannot essentially manipulate attributes. So, for example, if this is important, suppose that an attribute is the gender of the unit. Okay? So it's male or female. There is no causal effect of being a male. Because you cannot manipulate it, right? So, so essentially, this, it's not defined. That's an attribute. Okay. This model makes a very strong assumption. And we use it a lot. And I'm growing. Uh, Disappointed more and more about this assumption. Okay. This is called a stable unit treatment value assumption. Uh, and it says something very, very simple. It says that the potential outcome of every unit is only a function of the treatment that unit received and nothing else. Okay. This rule outs. Uh, externalities, it rules out equilibrium effects. So, so this model was conceived for very small scale experiments where there's no externalities. But we, in economics, then we end up using it into frameworks where there might be equilibrium effects uh, or externalities, and, and that uh, obviously. Um, problematic if the model violates SUBA. Right? Uh, that doesn't mean there are not designs to control for that, but then you move to some more structure, and that I will basically prefer to call it a structural model.
Okay, there are general solutions, like for example, if you think, oh, that's often the case, right? If you think that within school, if you treat the student one, that's going to affect student two, maybe you design your, your research by treating the whole school and compare schools instead of comparing individuals, right? So, so, so you go to, to larger units to try to avoid this, but an alternative will be to model this interaction. So, for example, someone sent me a paper about peer effects the other day. That will be an example of going and modeling um, these, these interactions. Although there's a huge uh, discussion about what those peer effects mean and whether they exist at all econometrically. Okay, so uh, under this uh, uh, model, we can write, the, now this is important, why I, why I is the outcome that we observe in the data set. So, so, so every time you observe uh, in your data set the, the outcome, let's say wages as before, for every individual, now in this, if you think in this framework, you have to think that some individuals are showing one potential outcome, the outcome when they were treated. When the other individuals are showing you the potential outcome when they are not treated. But there is the fundamental problem of causal identification, which is there's no single individual in your data set that shows you both potential outcomes, okay? Think about that because if we are going, I, the, that's why I like to start with this, with this uh, model, because if I have to give you a definition of a causal effect, this model is super nice. It tells you, well, let's come up with a definition of what's the causal effect, right? It's, it's, it's very simple. It's the difference between the two potential outcomes, right? In, I can define it for every individual. For individual I, I can say the causal effect of treatment D instead equal one instead of treatment D equal zero is just the difference of the two potential outcomes. And if individuals were showing us the two potential outcomes, then identification of causal effect will be trivial. Not only trivial, I could say what is the causal effect of treatment for every possible individual. In the, for every individual in the population, I can say what's the causal effect of this lecture for me is, is zero. I, I know all the stuff. And for, for some of you, it's very large, and for all, some of you, it's also zero because you know all this stuff, right? So, so this delta I will be different across, across individuals. But the fundamental problem of causal inference is that we, there's no single individual that shows us both, right? So what do we do? By the way, the, this is called the scientific solution to the problem of causal inference. So what we do is we give up. We don't try to get the scientific solution. We just go for a statistical solution. And the statistical solution is to take the average across the population of the delta i's. Right? And now we say, OK, I just cannot tell you what's the causal effect of this lecture to Sean that he listened already 10 times. Uh, it must be negative at this point. <laughs> especially this time in the morning. But uh, the average, I hope, is positive. The average, I hope, is positive. But then, if you, if you are following me, you can say, oh, but you know, still, the average is the expectation of Y1 over the whole population, minus the expectation of Y1 over the whole population. And you still don't have I1 for the whole population, and you still don't have I1 for the whole population. So how do you solve the problem by going to the average? Well, just by going to the average, I didn't solve the problem. I only got a possibility of solving the problem. 
right? Now, let's say that essentially treatment is just drawing a law uh, here, and so all of these individuals will get d equals zero, and all these individuals are going to get d equal one. Okay? And now it's the trick. Now it's the trick. All of you will show me I1. So I can compute without any bias, because you are a random sample also, the expectation of I1 conditional, not the expectation of I1, conditional on D being equal 1, which is you've been treated. Okay? And for you, I can compute trivially using the sample analog. Every time I say trivial, I mean using the sample analog. It's the, co the conditional expectation of I0 given D equals 0. So now what should be the trick? The trick is that conditioning on D doesn't change the expectation. If conditioning on D doesn't change the expectation, then the expectation of I1 condition on D equal 1 is equal to the expectation of I1. I just got the expectation of I1. Then I, I got the expectation of I0. I got the average streaming effect. So what does it mean in an intuitive way that the expectation of I condition on D is equal to the expectation of D? Well, it means that essentially the the expectation of I1 for this group is equal to the expectation of I1 for you. Right? That means you just cannot rely on condition and on D because it's the same. Okay? So what does it mean in very intuitive way? It means that when, when they show me I1, it's as if you were showing me I1. Okay? And when you show me I0, it's as if they were showing me I0. And that's why moving to the expectation could solve the problem, because it, I cannot say that when John shows me I1, it showed me Olga's I1. But that's implausible, right? But in average, in a large population, there is a possibility. And I'm going to tell you when we know for sure that's true. Now, suppose I randomize D, right? I randomize D. So the guys that got D equal 1 in a large population, right, will be on average equals to the guys that got D equal 0. So the expectation of I1 condition on D is equal to the expectation of I1. The expectation of I0 conditional on D uh, is equal to the expectation of I0. So that's why experiments solve the problem of identification of the average treatment effect. Okay, let me just uh, move uh, a bit ahead on this. Um, so, boy, well, it's not moving. Hmm. Assignment mechanisms. Let's keep this for a second. Yeah, I... Let's not skip it. Let's just talk about assignment mechanisms. There is three types of assignment mechanisms. So now I'm going to summarize all the econometrics with... with with this. There's going to be three types of assignment mechanisms. I'm going to talk about heterogeneity. I'm going to tell you all the problems that you have to deal with in any applied work. So there is an assignment mechanism. It's a probabilistic model for how some units receive the active treatment and some others receive control. Right? Essentially, it specifies the conditional probability of each vector assignment T, given the matrix of all covariates and potential outcomes. So, so essentially, there's the probability of receiving treatment given X and given the potential outcomes. What do I need for identification is that this is not uh, affected by the potential outcomes. The treatment that you receive 
is not affected by potential outcomes, then essentially the conditional expectation of I1 would be independent of, of, of treatment, right? So essentially, the first class of assignment mechanism is one of randomized experiments. And that's the definition of a randomized experiment, is that the probability of treatment given covariates and given potential outcomes is equal to the probability of treatment given covariates. Right? It's not a function of potential outcomes. Basically, then we can identify the average treatment effect for given x. That is going to be a stratified experiment, right? We also need the, a condition that um, no, all, all individuals have uh, a probability that's greater than zero and lower than one, okay? And we will say that when that happens, treatment D so, sorry, there was a bit of change in notation. I was calling T what I'm calling D in general. I apologize. Uh, so, D is uh, independent of potential outcomes given X. So then conditional on X, we can always identify the, the average causal effect of D, okay? But, but we, can, we can have uh, an a, a randomization that doesn't even condition on X. Okay, and that's called simple randomization. So it's randomized independent of X, and then essentially you have that D is independent of, uh, there is some treatment going on here. Uh, uh, D is independent uh, of the condition uh, outcomes period, and then you don't need to condition on X to recover the average causal effect. Okay. So this is, this is me mechanism one. It's, it's the ideal for identifying average causal effect. It's essentially conducting experiments. I, I hope you get that from, from, from there. There is a second assignment mechanism, which essentially claims the, the same. D is conditionally independent of the potential outcomes given X. But here is an assumption. I didn't no, I don't know that the probability that led to this exists because I didn't execute an experiment. It might be true or not, but for example, OLS. It's, it's, it's within this, or matching methods, right? It's, you make this assumption, you could uh, as well identify the average treatment effect, but now you are living in a world where you are making a strong assumption. Right? So let's put it in this way now. I say, you do an experiment, you know this is satisfied, this condition is satisfied, you identify the average causal effect, no doubt. You make this assumption, now you claim you identify the average treatment effect, now we discuss whether the assumption is true or not. That's the other way. The third mechanism is all the cases in which you cannot defend this assumption. Right? And that's everything that it exists. It's either you have an experiment, you know this assumption is satisfied, or you claim this assumption is satisfied, you convince people, or you don't convince people and you have to identify the aspects of the GDP that you can with other methods. And those other methods will be in reduced form setup, panel data or instrumental variables, I'm going to talk. Or you just fully model the whole DGP. Right? That, that's all, it, all the possibilities are summarizing these three mechanisms. There's nothing else. Obviously, as, uh, as I say, we, if we have a randomization condition on X, or if we make the 
the ignorability assumption condition on X, we first gonna recover the average treatment effect for X, and then we need to integrate over the distribution of, of X to get the average treatment effect, okay? There is a different parameter that is very useful uh, and it's not, you know, I just say, well, once, remember, we define the causal effect delta i as i1 minus i0, and then I say, well, we're never going to get to estimate delta 1. Let's just take the average. But that was arbitrary, right? That was a statistical solution to the problem of causal inference. I could have imagined many other and actually in the literature there's not even two, there's many. Heckman had several parameters, that, several averages that could be interesting. And not only averages, they could be quantiles. Right? There could be, there could be other moments in the population. But one that attracted a lot of attention is the average treatment effect on the treated, right? What's the difference between the average treatment effect and the average treatment on, on the treated? The difference is that then we condition on being treated. So now let's go back to the example. This group was treated. So if I now want to estimate the average treatment effect for them, what do I need? I need the average outcome under treatment for them. That, I always have it. They, all, they were showing me that, right? So what they don't show me is the average effect and they're not treated. So now I will take the other group and use them to estimate the average effect for this group. Right. So what I need is that for identification now of the treatment on the treated is less, it's much less than what I need for the average treatment effect. Okay, why? Why? Because for the average treatment effect, I needed two counterfactuals. I needed two. I need to estimate what would have happened to them if they would have not been treated, borrowing the outcomes of the control group. But I also need what would have happened to the control group if they would have been treated, and for that I would have borrowed the outcomes from the treatment group. While for the average treatment effect, I only need the, one counterfactual, which is what would have happened right, to them in, if uh, they are treated and I just borrow him from them. If you, if you think about, you might think, well, you know, this guy is not making sense. This is all abstract. Why just needing only one counterfactual? will have made such a difference in terms of identification. Yes, I'll tell you why. There is a very obvious selection, right? The selection based on the gains, right? So they selected based on the gains, right? Then it's implausible that essentially when they show me I1, that's a good counter estimate for the counterfactual of the people that did not select because they, they, they have a lower gain. So they, there has to be a, that the I1 on average is lower, right? So I, I, I can, by focusing on, on treatment on the treated, I, I can accommodate, accommodate the fact that people select into the treated. And then you may say, well, now if I compare the average of them to the average of them, I recover treatment on the treated by making the assumption, by making the assumption that they estimate, right? They estimate the That still is a strong assumption, but it's much weaker than just assume, assuming that this is valid both ways. And now, and now, if I remove that, that assumption, I can say, well, in the context of panel data, I can accommodate the differences with the fixed effects and I always can recover treatment on the treated with panel data. And that's why panel data is such a good method, okay? I'll, I'll talk later after the break on panel data and, and I get back to this point. But, but so, may, that's why I want to emphasize treatment on the treated, okay? But don't be confused because some people sometimes 
misa interpret treatment on the treated by saying, oh, treatment on the treated is better than the average treatment effect, because the average treatment effect is the effect on the whole population, and we only care about the poor. And, and, and so we need to look at only the effect of the poor. That has nothing to do with the difference between average treatment effect and treatment on the treated. So if you only care about the poor, that's fine. That's conditional on X. It's not conditional on being treated. On the, on the poor, they still there are treated and non-treated. And that's the difference between average treatment effect and treatment on the treated, right? It's not the fact that you take a subpopulation of the whole population. All right, so let me now, as I promise, uh, summarize all this into a very nice equation. Let me uh, just state the assumption. It's, the assumptions are very simple. I mean the potential outcome model. Every individual has two potential outcomes. And now the only thing I'm going to say is there is a proportion P that's going to get treated. Okay? That's the proportion P. So then the average treatment effect can be decomposed into pi times the average treatment effects for those that are treated. So think of that's the treatment on the treated for the treated. Plus 1 minus pi for the average treatment effect of the non-treated, which will be the equivalent of the treated on the treated for the other group, okay? So then if I do it, it's very just substitutions and all that, uh, I'm gonna get to this formula. No, not this formula, this formula. This formula is uh, extremely nice, right? Summarize, I guess, everything in econometrics, the matter for identification. It's saying the estimator of the average treatment effect is equal to the average treatment effect plus the potential biases. And what are these two po potential biases? There's two sources of that. Normally, People call all of this together self-selection or selection, right? But let's decompose this into two things. One is baseline difference. So what is the baseline difference saying? It's, it's the expectation of the outcome under no treatment is the same for both groups, right? So if, if that is zero, it means that under no treatment, both groups will have, have the same average, right? So what is the other uh, term, uh, when is the other term zero? Is when the both groups have the same gain, right? But if the both groups have the same average under no treatment and both group, groups have the same gain, means that both groups have the same outcome under no treatment and both groups have the same outcome under treatment. That's exactly what an experiment warranted and that's exactly what I say we need to identify the average treatment effect. Right? So we identify the average treatment effect when both groups have the same average outcome under treatment and under no treatment. And that's what the, an experiment guarantees. And if I randomize individuals, I know for sure that under no treatment they will have performed the same and under treatment they will have, have the same gains because they didn't select into treatment based on the gain. And that's why an experiment is so powerful to solve the selection problem, okay? Now, let's say that people select because of the gains. People select because of the gain. The, the people that is receiving treatment is the only people that will benefit, right? Can I recover the average treatment effect for a whole population? No, I can't, right? I, I, at least I make assumptions about structure that allows me to extrapolate, but in this setup, in this setup, I cannot, because there's no way I can infer from the individuals that are treated what will have been the gain of the other guys, because I'm just saying they have the different gains, right? 
Now, obviously, if I then say the gain is a function of some covariance that I observe, I, I can start to extrapolate or modeling, right? That's a different setup. But in this setup, I want to be clear, we cannot, right? Now, if there's no base rate difference, but there is treatment heterogeneity, what can I recover? Treatment on the treated. Treatment on the treated can be recovered because the only thing I, I need to estimate the gain of this group is what will have happened to them in the absence of treatment. And that's exactly going to be estimated from the other group. If there's no baseline difference, then I can recover treatment on the treated. So, so treatment on the treated is a weaker uh, it's a parameter that, that requires weaker assumptions to be identified, allows for selection based on the gains on the program, as long as there's no baseline selection. So, yeah. No. So, yeah, yeah, everyone can ask. So at least I think I learned something in 10 lectures. I have a different question, which is, where do they put the assumption of unique mapping between treatment and outcomes? In other words, what if the treatments map onto multiple outcomes? So even if you have only one average treatment and you correctly randomize between the two groups, it is not guaranteed that if you repeat the treatment, you will get a similar outcome. So the way I think about this is that one of the things that bothers me in the medical literature is that they have all these control groups, right? And they're sort of fully randomized. But for medicines, they know that the majority of the time, there's a placebo effect even on the untreated group. So what one problem you have is that imagine that the drug right. really is not... I, I, yeah, it's true. So that will be a, um, a violation of SUDBA in this model, right? That will be a violation of SUDBA because then then, the, the, in a way, you, you basically are, the potential outcome of the control group depends on the fact that others were treated and, and they received placebo. Right. So just to be clear, you're saying that virtually all the published medical drug trials violate SUTBA? No. No, not necessarily, uh, but uh, there is um, not, not necessarily in the sense that um, if there is a placebo effect, right? But not, not so the, the, the idea of double, double blind was to avoid that, right? So I think uh, in, in economics uh, or in social science, we cannot have double blind, and, 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 and maybe we are even more susceptible to, to this problem. But, but, uh, but you are more aware than me of the medicine literature and, and the fact that they think the, the double blind doesn't solve always the placebo effect, right? So, so but, but I just don't know as to make that statement as strong as you as you made, especially under uh, something that's going to stay forever online. <laughs> so, no, it's, yeah, but, but, but I, I, I'll um, tell you something that is, in my view, more worrisome about, um, uh, it's related. It, uh, in, in some sense, and I think it's more worrisome in, in medicine. Uh, and, and let me, um, let me skip this for, for, for just to, for only to answer you or, or get to, maybe this is a bad idea. Yeah, here. So, we want to get, let's say, the average treatment effect of a, of a new drug, right, as you were putting, for, for some type of cancer, right? 
so colon cancer. And, and, and so essentially, they are obviously, the, the, it's not going to necessarily be a control group with placebo because there's going to be an etiquette. So there's going to be a, an established treatment, and the idea will be to prove that the new drug is better, right? So, so, so but now, First, we have to define the population, right? That's key. That, that's something not everyone thinks a lot about in in, in, in research. And, um, and so, when you get to the population, let's say that the, what you care if is is all cancer patients, right? But but you can't force people to be part of an experiment. Right, you can't. That, the only thing you can do is to randomize once people sign up for your experiment, right? But ideally, essentially, what we want to do is to take the population of all the cancer patients in, in every stage, right? And also, depend, you will have ones that are responding very well to the actual treatment. Think about that situation. There is the ones that are really improving, and then there are ones that are not improving, right? So you say, oh, there is this new, new, new drug. Do you want to really be part of a trial? Oh, I say, I'm doing well with my, my actual treatment. I just don't want. So, so there you have selection. There you have selection, right? So if the sample is randomized, you don't have selection. But if the sample is not randomized, you have selection. Then you randomize to treatment and control. And then you identify the causal effect. But that causal effect of that particular study is not representative of the causal effect in the population. And, and, and I think there's a lot of that into, into research, uh, both in, in, in medicine, a lot in psychology, <laughs> And a lot in economics as well, right? Because essentially, um, and that's why now we created this new language as well of external validity and internal validity, right? The, the internal validity is the fact that you can attribute ca the average causal effect for your sample. But remember my first slide. We want to know about the parameters in the population, not in the sample. Obviously, if the sample is random of the population, it's no way, no need to distinction. But, but because a lot of the studies we do, in, not in, 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 in only in economics, as I say, in, in medicine, as you point out, in, in, in social science, like psychology, are in my lab, in my hospital, in my, in my uh, villages in India, right? Uh, we, we are only randomizing at the second stage. That way, a statistician knew this forever. This actually, I took it from Kish book, which is published in 1966, about basically the, the gold standard is not randomized, it's two-stage randomization, okay? I think this is much more serious than any, any other stuff. Because you can, you can easily, See that if you read a paper of an, of an RCT done in one hospital, and that hospital is among certain demographics, it's located in one area with certain demographics, uh, that what they learn there could not generalize at all to in, in many other populations, right? But you know, then what can you do? Uh, the, and and, and I, I think the, the, just not to be that uh, pessimistic, uh, you, you, you want to do, I think you want to replicate experiments in different populations. I, I, I really believe in that. I, I actually have done that twice already. And I'm a strong uh, believer in, in, in that replication it's mostly about doing, not r just look at the code of the previous experiment, that's fine as well, but it's mostly about redoing the experiment in different populations. And obviously, if you know, 
if you could really write a very rich structural model that will take all this heterogeneity into account, then you can predict the causal effect for every subgroup out of your model, that will be great. You don't need all this. But we haven't really mapped down from theory all these nuisances in many cases as to only believe that we can do it with models. Although when, when it's possible, it's great. It's, it, I know. Uh, against that either. Actually, I'm much in favor about that. Okay, here I, I just have a serious problem with the slide, uh, which I don't know how to solve it other than this. So let me now define a structural equation. You, you may say, Fah, why he's going to define a structural equation? Well, because in not econometric textbook is done. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's difficult. The structure equation seems to be what you write down there. But, but I have a problem because I say there is the DCP, there is the model, and they might be different. So what is the structure equation? So let me say that the equation y equals beta times x plus epsilon is says to be structural if it's to be interpreted as follow. Okay. I'm going to read it. In an ideal experiment, and you see, this is in the Havelmo spirit, that essentially when you write that, that equation there, you are thinking about a counterfactual experiment. In an ideal experiment where we control x to some value and any other set of variables c, uh, that are not containing x and y to some other value, the value y of the random variable y is given by the equation, and epsilon is not a function of x and z. Right? So it, may, it might seem to you very contrived, but let me tell you, it's the only way we can define it. Because what I'm saying is, you know, I just can define an, an structural equation as a lot of textbooks do by saying that only epsilon is mean independent of x. Because that's not satisfied, it's not true when there is simultaneity. When there is simultaneity, that is always false. And still, there is a system of structural equations. I see, you have to come up with this idea that essentially the structural equation could allow why could allow simultaneity, but it's not going to be a problem under this definition because I'm not allowing the equation that says x is determined by y playing any role because I'm saying I'm fixing exogenously x to some value x, all other sets to some other values, right? So, and then epsilon is not a function of x and z, and y is given by beta x plus epsilon. See, why everything plays a role. So, if epsilon is a function of x, then that cannot be the, fun the, fu the correct functional form, because X is in the other term, so it means that X affects Y in a different way than just being multiplied by beta. Okay? If epsilon is a function of Z, it means that there are some other omitted variables that should be in the equation. Then that can be the structural equation. Okay? So that's what it said. So, I always, when I was an undergrad, the first time I took econometrics, I did very bad. <laughs> no, no, I never was a super straight, I don't know, I was a plus student anyway, but econometrics was very difficult. I used to say, I don't really understand this thing, causality. Um, one of the typical problems that I had in my mind for years was, well, okay, 
Uh, I write this equation. It's a structure. Y equals beta x plus epsilon. There is an equal sign there, right? There is an equal sign. Then if I know some algebra and x is not zero, it has to be that x is also equal to y minus epsilon divided beta. Or if beta is not zero, right? That, that's mathematically is true. I don't know if you were ever puzzled by this. But if this were true, that, that, nothing makes sense. What, what, what we are talking about, x cos y, now I am saying y cos x. Right? It's just, then it doesn't make sense. Well, do you know what's the answer to this? The equal doesn't mean equal. That's the answer. Equal means there is an arrow going into that direction. And that's how biologists that also do structural modeling write their models. The fact that we are really low in this quantitative thing of doing the marginal effects and saying what will happen to y is call us for the equal sign. But, but if we were going to start again, I think we should first put an arrow after the model is identified and we establish the causality goes in that direction, then we are allowed to put the equal sign and do the counterfactual, right? But, but so, it's tricky, but that's the way we have to think. We, in, in the following sense, that, that we cannot do that. There is another equation for y that could be a function of x, but the parameter associated to x is not 1 over v. It's, it could be any other thing. And, and when that happens, there is simultaneity. Okay? Now I'm going to get into uh, this T0 operator. It's going to be too technical now uh, for five minutes. Uh, but let me, let me essentially say that yeah, I'm going to get here. Essentially, what all this complicated notation I have is, is to basically show that if I, if I know the structural model, I can go to the reduced, to the Rubin model. Okay? I can go from one model to the other. But I cannot go uh, from the Rubin model to the structural model. And that makes a big difference. And that's why then we economists like, I guess, better structural models. They are, they, they are more, they, they have more information. But we have to be careful now. We, and that's why I say I'm very open-minded and, 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 and in, in, I try to see virtues on, 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 on everything. It's kind of, you know, yeah, if you ask, if you tell me, what do you prefer? The, just the, 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 uh, the reduced form of the structural model uh, at no cost, the structural model. I can always go back to, to the reduced form. But this, there is no at no cost, right? There is cost because there are no free lunches. And then that's the trade-off in every research. You need to learn how to uh, assess and decide what, what is best to answer the question at hand. So let me uh, clarify this with, with what I'm going to call direct and total effects, which in the literature I call structural and reduced form. But I think that's not the best terminology. Okay. So think about this model. This will be the uh, equation three and four are now the uh, process that the data generating process, the DCP. Yi is equal to beta 1 plus beta d times di plus beta x times xi plus ui. Okay, that's, the, that's one equation. The other equation is xi equal to alpha 1 times alpha d di plus epsilon i. So now, uh, I can substitute equation 4 into the structural equation 3. 
right? And get equation five. And that's basically a reduced form model, right? So now, now if I regress y on d, I get what? Beta d, and beta d is the direct effect, or what we econometricians call a structural parameter, it's the direct effect of d on y, right? And now you'll see what, what I like to call direct and total. What's the total effect? The total effect is the one in the reduced form. And actually, both are an interesting parameter. So it's not that one is much better than the other. Obviously, what is much better is to know equation three and equation four. That's what I was saying. Because if I know equation three and equation four, I can always get equation five. The problem, whoever, if you only get equation five, you can never go to, the di to separate the direct from the indirect effect. So you get think that the total effect is the indirect effect plus the direct effect. And that will be optimal. You know everything. But, but that's much more difficult in terms of identification. There's no free lunch. So if you have to choose, well, you will choose what you can be identified. So suppose that now we randomize D, right? We randomize D. What you can recover for sure? Well, you can recover the total effect, right? Because you can always compare the mean of Y for those that get D equal one to the mean of y for those that get d equal zero, that's this parameter here. So the, the, the Rubin causal model is about the total effect. It never, it's never, uh, it was never posed to separate the, the part of the effect that is direct from the part of the effect that is indirect. Right? There was no parameters there. It just say What's the causal effect? Is, is the outcome under treatment and the outcome under no treatment? It's essentially estimating this equation. Right? It's the total effect. But we economists like a lot the direct effect and the indirect effect because they go to the core of cost-benefit analysis. Right? So let me give you an example. Suppose I just randomize D, and, and, and it's an example I'm going to use after the break. We randomize e, D, D is sending the children to early uh, schooling, let's say uh, pre-primary education. And that basically, uh, why are the school performance? How they do uh, later in life in terms of, of performance? So suppose we, you find when you do the reduced form, that those that got D equal one do better. Means that those that go to pre-primary education improve their, their scores. From, from a policy perspective, you can say, fine, that's all I want to know. I, uh, what, what does it matter why, right? Uh, it, it might, why, why, if you look at equation three and four, it is saying it could be because they went to the school or it could be because because they went to the school, their mothers were able to work more, and X is the income of the mother. And it's really the income of the mother that is improving. So here, just the Ministry of Education said, so whatever, you know, I know that I build this school, children do much better. Yeah, but I want to do the cost-benefit analysis, and I have to take, if it's coming from the mother changing behavior, I need to take that into the welfare considerations, right? So it's not only the cost of the school involved. Well, if it's only the school, it's a different thing. So now, let me ask you, I randomize D, I randomize D, and I know for sure I can get equation five, I can identify equation five, I can get the total effect. Can I identify equation three? Right? Still, X is endogenous, and I don't have an instrument for X. Right? Some mothers reacted, 
to thee, others didn't, and that's not exogenous. And, and obviously, uh, you can think of a, of a more sophisticated experiment where you, you randomize, well, you can randomize the response of the mother, but you can randomize a voucher to go to a search for a shop. And then with that voucher, you can instrument X. And then, yeah, you can recover both. But only by randomizing D, you cannot uh, recover the a whole structural equation, OK? But we, we like to recover equation three. So the, the thing that we, it's at really at the frontier of research, and uh, part of my most recent work, is to sort of have an experiment, estimate a structural model where a lot is identified through functional form assumptions, like here would be uh, the effect of X identifies through some assumptions, and then use the model to predict some moments of the experiment to kind of validate the, the assumptions I made. Uh, and I can talk a bit more after the break. I think I, I, I have to stop now. But what, what, after the break, what I'll, I'll do is to talk a bit about when we don't have an experiment, so how do we solve um, uh, is still this reduced form parameters with IV and panel later, and then I do a couple of examples. Um, and then if I have time, I go back to the, the structural um, um, and combine with experiments. Uh, obviously, w what I call here structure was very, very simple, all linear, right? The structure might could be nonlinear and then and it could be very, very sophisticated these days, but the, the, at the high cost of strong assumptions, right? Yeah. So thank you, Sebastian.